In this video, we're going to look at biomolecules, the macromolecules that are important for living things. We're going to look at molecules like carbohydrates and lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. As we look at each of these molecules, we're going to uh, talk about the function of the molecules. We're going to give some examples of those molecules. We're going to look at what the building blocks of each of these large molecules might be how we put them together, how we take them apart, and any other interesting stuff that comes up. Let's start with carbohydrates. We'll talk about the functions and some examples. For example, carbohydrates are known to be a good energy source. Things such as sugars, glucose, sucrose, fructose, galactose, maltose, they're all simple sugars, monosaccharides and disaccharides, and notice that all of them end in the suffix O-S-E. That's something you're going to need to know, that any time in biology uh, a molecule's name ends in O-S-E, you can be sure that it's a sugar. Other functions of carbohydrates are as energy storage. Plants store their energy in a form of carbohydrate called starch, and animals can sh will store energy short term in a carbohydrate uh, called glycogen, which we found a lot. We find a lot uh, stored in muscles and in the uh, liver. Oops, liver. Carbohydrates can also be used as a structural material. For example, cellulose is the primary component of this plant cell walls. It's plant fiber, and chitin is a carbohydrate that's found in the exoskeleton of arthropods, also in the cell walls of fungal cells. When we look at carbohydrates, we see that they're polymers. M almost all of our biomolecules are polymers. So what is a polymer? A polymer means many something or many mers. Uh, the, uh, we can contrast polymers versus monomers. Uh, a monomer is a single unit. And carbohydrates are polymers of sugars or saccharides. Let's look at an example. Here we have a molecular molecule a model of a single sugar or a monosaccharide. In this case, it's a model of glucose, and here's a, a structural diagram showing that same molecule. It's a single unit or a monomer, a monosaccharide, in this case, a single sugar. Uh, and as we see something very interesting, this carbohydrate, look at the word carbohydrate, probably has carbon, hydrogen, and ATE. Uh, 8 uh, is an indicator that it has oxygen. Uh, so carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are the only three elements found in a carbohydrate. Now if we think about this molecule, I'll ask the question, uh, do you think that this molecule is soluble in water? And if so, why? You need to think back to our properties of water video. But as I look at this, I see uh, an important functional group that shows up over and over again. This is the hydroxyl functional group and we know that hydroxyl groups are polar and we know that polar substances dissolve well in water so the answer to this question is of course yes because it's polar now we said that carbohydrates are polymers polymers of sugars so they must be repeated units of sugars so let's look how, look how we can take two single sugars or monosaccharides and put them together so I've drawn two uh, monosaccharides down here, two single sugars, and I look at them and see how I might be able to put them together. And if I were to move over here and take this OH group, this hydroxyl group off, and strip away a hydrogen from this side, uh, this is enough to make what molecule? What do you see that you can make there? Well, I think I can make water. And with what's left over, I can connect because this carbon needs another uh, bond and this carbon needs another bond and oxygen likes to make two bonds I can bind those two molecules through that, car uh, through that oxygen molecule this is called a glycosidic uh, linkage and so what I did here was I pulled out water to build a bond we have a name for that process stop the video and write that down if you know it I pulled water, I dehydrated, to build a bond, to synthesize. We call this process 
dehydration synthesis, sometimes referred to as the condensation reaction. Hopefully you can see that if I have uh, another sugar over here, I could do this same process again and pull out another water molecule to build another bond. And I can do this over and over and over, creating a polymer, a, a strand of many sugars together, a polysaccharide. Well, if putting poly uh, sugars together is that easy, the question then is how do we take them apart? How do we undo this building that we just did? And the answer is to just reverse the process. If I add the water molecule back in, then I would break this bond. Oops, put that there. And hopefully uh, add my parts back in over here. And you can see that uh, we undo that bond or digest that uh, carbohydrate in a process called hydrolysis. So hydrolysis is the opposite of dehydration synthesis. And hope that you can see that hydro, water, and lysis means to cut. So we're cutting with water. Here we see three sugars put together. We can see that we built uh, a glycos glycosidic linkage there and there. We had to take water out each time. And we could, again, put another sugar here and here and here and uh, build a very long chain of sugars or a complex carbohydrate. And for each of these bonds, it would require one water molecule to break it apart and digest away this complex carbohydrate. And that brings us to lipids. We define lipids very clearly as a nonpolar organic molecule. And since they're nonpolar, they're by definition hydrophobic. They don't like water. This group of molecules is very diverse, meaning there's a lot of different types. It's not so simple as carbohydrates. But let's look at some functions and examples of lipids. One function we find with lipids is that they're a good place to store energy. For example, as fats and oils. They're structural material, especially phospholipids and cholesterols. They're found uh, plentiful in the cell membranes of all cells. We can use them as water barriers. Because of their nonpolar uh, hydrophobic nature, they make a good water barrier. Oils and waxes are built from lipids, or they are lipids. And finally, uh, another example of a function of lipids is as messenger molecules. We see them act as hormones, or the, the, some of the steroid lipids are, are hormones. The building block of lipids, or one of the building blocks, are fatty acids. So let's look at an individual fatty acid. To draw a fatty acid, we simply start with a hydrocarbon chain. If we fill this up with hydrogens, we know that simple hydrocarbons all have the same property, but we're going to make this slightly different by adding a functional group to it. And the functional group that we're going to add is, well, let's stop and think about it, it's a fatty acid. So which one of our functional groups was acidic? Hopefully you recall that the functional group that was acidic, and let me fix this, was the carboxyl group. This functional group, the carboxyl, was acidic. And so the simplest way to make a fatty acid is take a hydrocarbon chain and add a carboxyl group on the end. So here I've built one uh, ahead of time. I'm going to move this one out of the way uh, to make room. Let's get this one out of here, make this a little cleaner. I turned this one around. But I want to compare a couple different types of fatty acids. Now you may have heard the term saturated fats and unsaturated fats. One of them's good for you, one of them's bad for you. I can't remember which is which. Um, but here's a fatty acid. And so if we think about the word saturated for a moment, what does the word saturated mean? Let's look at the root of the word uh, saturated, or S-A-T. Let's think of other words that have that in there. How about satisfied or, or sated? I want to bring up another uh, drawing of a fatty acid and tell you which one's saturated, which one's unsaturated, and then we know figure out what this means. So here's another sa uh, another fatty acid, and this one is unsaturated. So now you should be able to see what the term means. Sated means full. Satisfied means you have everything you want. So a saturated fatty acid is saturated. It's full. And this unsaturated fatty acid isn't full. What's it not full of? Well, it could be holding two more hydrogens except for this double bond. 
makes it so that it can't. So a saturated fatty acid is one that has no double bonds in the main part of the chain, whereas an unsaturated fatty acid will have at least one, uh, therefore it's not full of hydrogens. And here I brought over another fatty acid, and you can see we could call this one polyunsaturated because it has more than one double bond. It's uh, lacking, it has a double bond here uh, and here, so it's really not full. So polyunsaturated. So here we can see some simple fatty acids and the difference between saturated, unsaturated, and polyunsaturated. Now fatty acids are a building block, so let's put together uh, a typical fat or a triglyceride. Let's build one. Here's the first question, and uh, I'll say ahead of time it's a trick question. How many parts are there to a triglyceride? Well, like I said, it's misleading. You might think there are three, but let's wait and see. The first molecule we need is this simple molecule. It's called glycerol. It's a three-carbon chain uh, with three hydroxyl groups on it. Now let's grab a fatty acid and see how we could put those two things together. Well, I could remove this OH, and I could remove, whoops, hold on, I could remove an H from here, and those two H's plus that uh, oxygen is enough to make water, and what's left behind is room to build a bond. So we pulled out water, and we built a bond. We did what process? Yes, dehydration synthesis. Now this is a triglyceride, so how many times do you think we need to add uh, to do this, to add how many fatty acids? So hopefully you can see I can do this two more times. I could take out another water there and another water there, and uh, at the end I would have a triglyceride, which is made of one glycerol and three fatty acids. And it would require the removal of three water molecules. In order to break this down, we would have to do the opposite again. Add the water back in and break the bond. And in that process, we would call <coughs> hydrolysis to cut with water. Now, some other lipids, we said lipids were for diverse, were our phospholipids. And a phospholipid, if you look at it closely, is not uh, too different than a triglyceride. There's the glycerol base. Here are two fatty acid chains. But the difference is there's a phosphate group and an additional carbon chain up here. Luckily, we never have to draw that. We can just draw this thing here, uh, this model of the molecule with a phosphate head and two lipid tails. And the interesting thing about this molecule is the unique properties that it has. The lipid tails we know are nonpolar, these fatty acid tails. So they're hydrophobic. And the phosphate head is polar, so it's hydrophilic. So you have one side of this molecule that likes water and one side that does not, which is important when we look at how these are used in the cell membrane in uh, our next uh, our video, actually probably the two videos from now. And the other group of lipids we have are the sterols. And the sterols are very unique because they don't have fatty acid chains, but they do have this very unique uh, structure that you should not mistake for anything else. Anytime you see this backbone of four carbon rings like this, you can just say sterol or steroid and be sure that it's a lipid and by definition that it's a nonpolar molecule. Uh, for example, testosterone and the estradiol, the sex hormones, but also cholesterol. And if we look at the word cholesterol, it's, it's in there that it's a steroid. I'm going to stop this video here and come back uh, for part two. And in part two, we're going to look at the nucleic acids and the, uh, the proteins, and uh, then we'll be uh, done. So come back for part two.